I know I said this video was gonna be ready last weekend, but this channel has already become the the channel of broken promises. So hey, I'm here. So let's talk about books. Books, books. Their meaning in our life is undeniable. Book lovers would all agree that the following statement is true. Books give us life. In so many ways, we associate books with an easing of the soul and a peacement of the mind. Since the advent of the novel in the 18th century, literature's positive effects on aspects of our lives have been widely acknowledged. Early novels such as Pamela and Robinson Crusoe are greatly credited not just with bringing written printed words to the masses, but more so with propagating a broader sense of life, a deeper understanding of empathy, human nuisance, and interiority to a deeply beneficial effect. In many cases, books have made life rife with meaning and self-reflection. Other times, they have brought us perspectives we would have otherwise never experienced, helping us understand life at large. And in many more cases still, I have personally heard many people speak of a certain book, a special story that has literally saved their lives. Books like Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning have often been celebrated as little beacons of hope, instructions on how to live and what to live for. Books are sure to have saved countless lives because they have helped people cope, understand, fight, acknowledge their worth, and in many cases have helped people with taking a step off a ledge, sometimes literally. However, if we accept that books give us life, can the opposite be true? Can books give us death? That is the pessimistic and morbid question that I will set out to answer today. I have personally always wondered if the power of literature can profoundly affect our brain in such an extreme way. My previous videos have centered heavily on transgressive and disturbing literature, and being that horror is my favorite genre, I have often read literature that has made my jaw drop in shock, has made me anxious, uneasy, or has made me just shut a book in frustration or disgust. My fellow people who have also treaded this territory of literature have more than likely also wondered the same thing. Is there a story so powerfully shocking, so scary, so perverse, or fearful that it could cause such irreversible damage to the reader? With all this in mind, I am essentially asking, can a book kill you? By the way, the sources for this video will mostly involve the list of unusual deaths article on Wikipedia and whatever random clippings I've been able to find scavenging across the web, all of which I will link in the description. If you were looking for a thorough and well-researched video, hey, I'm, I'm really trying my hardest, but there will probably be several examples that I surely missed. If you know of any, please let me know, because I really want to know. So, can a book kill you? The answer can be yes or no, depending on what we mean when we say book. To answer this question, we have to get at the heart of what a book is. Why? Well, because if books are going to be a murder weapon, we have to exhaust the possibilities as to what a book can do. And to do that, we have to be certain about what a book is. People tend to confuse or transform the definition of a book. I think books become a metonymy for what books signify and represent which is just the nature of speech, but for the purposes of this video, it is essential to specify. Often, the word book is used to describe both the physical object and the contents thereof. Book literally refers to a thing, a thing with a spine and pages that are glued inside. But figuratively, book can also refer to the literature, the prose which the physical object contains. It refers often to the more abstract art form of written word, its various theories and psychological workings, and indeed it's this second definition that's often most associated with life-giving. It's the contents of a book that give us life. The book, as in the object, I don't think anyone could say has changed their lives or impacted them unless Perhaps you're reading something that's physically significant as much as literarily, like House of Leaves. Now, why am I rambling on about the definition of a book? 
Because the methods of death of which a book may be the culprit and which I will talk about can be separated into two different sections. Death by book as in the physical object and death by book as in the practice of reading. Death by words, by content, by sentences and the thoughts they create. You'll see exactly what I mean, but for now, let's just make this distinction clear. So then let's open up this forensic investigation, if you will, and explore the causes and possibilities behind a death by book. For the first few causes of book-related deaths, I will be addressing books as the physical objects that they are. Books come in many shapes and sizes. Hardback, paperback, encyclopedic tomes, flimsy little pamphlets, long books, short books, etc., etc., etc. Now, how do we tend to perceive books? I think even the biggest, bulkiest tomes, for the most part, tend to just blend into the background. Books, the physical things, are inoffensive things, quotidian things that fade into the scenery of a classroom or personal library. It is somewhat curious how we often never really consider the physicality of books at all. When booktubers, scholars, readers in general refer to these things, they are using them as signifiers to refer to the pleasures of reading the literature within. Maybe some will ogle at a pretty cover design, but I think that's about it. Well, now that we're opening up a space in this channel to regard the physicality of books, let's go ahead and explore how deadly they can be. Here is perhaps the bulkiest book I own, Dreamcatcher by Stephen King. This book sucks, but let's see if it can be put to any other good use. The book is almost a thousand pages. Uh, it's hardcover, it's pretty hefty and of considerable size in terms of length and width. Um, the heaviness of it means it has a lot going for it and the sharp edges of the hardcover pace could easily do some extra damage. Now, I'm holding in my hands a big-ass book. Now, let's see. Am I also holding a possible murder weapon? By all accounts that I was able to find, yes. There have been multiple, yes, multiple, recorded cases of people being bludgeoned to death by books. The sheer blunt force trauma of being pummeled by one of these babies is indeed enough strength to kill another human being. Now, as opposed to blunt force trauma leading to death caused by larger, more potent objects than this, like a bat or a plank of wood, if you really wanted to kill someone with a book, your best bet would probably be hitting someone over the head with it, being that I really don't think you would be able to cause enough organ damage or bone breaking elsewhere in the body. You would probably need various direct hits to the side of the head or other vulnerable parts of the skull. If we want to get into the forensics of this, basically, if stricken on the head with enough force with a heavy object, um, probably heavier than this, maybe try the Oxford English Dictionary, though I'm sure King's shit show would probably do the work in a pickle. Um, it can cause bruising in the cerebral cortex when your brain essentially bounces around in your skull. Uh, if it bounces around with enough force, it can even lead to serious damage to nerve cells deeper still inside the brain. Besides this, the constant impact to the skull can lead to other deadly possibilities, such as a part of your skull fracturing and lodging itself in the brain, or the layers of the skull caving in or jutting out, resulting in dozens and dozens of irreparable fractures that can most certainly lead to death. If you were to be murdered with a book, which one would you want it to be? Comment below. Now, do you want to know what the most popular literary weapon of choice is when it comes to beating someone to death? That would be the Bible. If you ever wondered where the expression Bible thumping comes from, I suspect it may well come from beating someone to death. You can find various examples of recorded cases in which someone was beaten to death with a Bible, and I can only imagine how many more still have gone unrecorded. For instance, back in 1903, a patient from Honolulu, Hawaii, being treated for malaria, was brought to a healing ceremony after the government physician of the district had failed to provide any solace or improvement to his condition. 
The kahuna leading the healing ceremony almost immediately declared that the man was possessed by demons, and a ritualistic exorcism was required at once. Now, what did the ritual consist of? Well, it consisted of this man already suffering from malaria, being told to sit still while the kahuna beat him over the head repeatedly with a Bible. Needless to say, the man died as a result of the attack. The kahuna was brought to the authorities on charges of manslaughter, with his defense being that he was only trying to exercise the demons. He didn't actually mean to kill him. I couldn't find any information on his conviction, but I imagine it didn't go well. There even exist recent examples of these biblical manslaughters. In July of 2018, a 40-year-old man named Leslie Satney, who lived in Eatonville, Florida, was charged with the murder of his girlfriend. When police entered his home, they found the dead body of Crystal Phillips lying on the floor next to a bloody Bible. Satney claimed that his girlfriend was being accosted by demons and that the murder was a way for him to save her from being possessed. Now, of course, this is an extremely tragic case of mental illness and violence against women, and I don't mean to make light of such severe subjects. I'm merely bringing attention to this because it will play a key role later on when we come to consider how deadly literature can really be. Bibles being constant weapons of choice when it comes to murdering someone may well be because, well, the Bible is a pretty bulky book, often bound in hard materials and printed in even bigger sizes than this. But I suspect the reasons go well beyond just the physicality of the Bible, a reason that we will be expanding on further along in this video. If you take away any lesson from this, let it be this. Just buy paperbacks instead. However, if you thought a paperback is completely inoffensive in design, when we compare it to the big evil hardback killing machines, you would be wrong. Also, if you thought we were done with the Bible-related deaths, you would also be wrong. How could something so soft and flimsy be used to kill someone? Well, unfortunately, a Canadian man named Franco Brun found a way. Franco Brun was an inmate serving a 15-day sentence at Metro East Detention Center in Scarborough, Canada in 1987 for petty crimes. By June 9th of that year, Brun had been transferred to a windowless, isolated cell after he was seen by a guard exposing himself in a sexual way from his window. A psychiatrist had previously prescribed medication after diagnosing Brun as being in the midst of a psychotic episode, yet Brun violently refused to ingest the medication. Now, as a rule, everyone in this detention center was allowed a Bible if one was asked for, and Brun, who had deep religious beliefs, requested one. He was provided a red paperback 2-inch, 4-inch Gideon's Bible, much like one of these. Hours after being transferred to his windowless cell, a passing guard noticed that Brun's mouth and cheeks had a pink tinge to them. The guard simply figured his skin was reddened, as Brun had been seen stretching his cheeks and shoving fists in his mouth previously. However, soon enough, guards were alerted to the fact that Brun was lying on the floor unconscious, no longer breathing. It was at this moment that the guards realized the red tint around his face was not red in skin, but the ink from the red cover of the Bible, which had mixed with his spit and stained his face. Brun was pronounced dead that evening, shortly after being transferred to Scarborough General Hospital, where the cause of death was ruled asphyxia by choking. Anesthetist and respiratory specialist Dr. Peter Charlebois had made a gruesome and appalling discovery. Brun's pocket-sized Bible was found lodged behind his soft palate at the back of his throat, from the level of his nose down to his larynx, somewhere around here. Dr. Charlebois was completely shocked by his finding, and he was even unable to pull the Bible out of Brun's throat while he was being provided emergency treatment. After his death, Dr. Charlebois even felt compelled to rule the death as murder, given that he was in complete disbelief that a man could possibly swallow an entire book so far deep down their throat on their own. However, as investigations developed and Brun's previous history of violent and erratic behavior surfaced, added to the fact that no one had been in Brun's cell the night of his death, there was no other option but to conclude Brun's death had been self-inflicted. However, another curious finding that surfaced was the fact that Brun's death was not ruled a suicide, 
but rather accidental. It was in all the experts' agreements that Brun had not meant to kill himself when he swallowed a Bible. Brun had apparently spoken of demons overtaking his body and attacking him and tainting him, and his act of swallowing a Bible was a twisted and desperate attempt at purifying his body in a way by consuming a religious artifact. The blame was placed entirely on the object, the book itself, and what it represented to him. This was a textbook case, no pun intended, of death by book. What particularly disturbed me about this case was just imagining how unbelievably painful and horrid this death must have been. The feeling of a blocky object lodged in your throat beyond your soft palate, and try and try as you might, you cannot get air to pass through to your lungs. Spit is building in your mouth and you're drooling out that bitter, inky taste of the book as it slowly, painfully dissolves in your throat. The mush of the wet pages mixed with saliva expanding inside and rubbing against and cutting up the softness of your larynx. This has got to be one of the absolute worst ways to go. Well, there you have it. Petite, flimsy little paperbacks. Not as innocent as you might have thought. Some of us may have heard the phrase, death by a thousand paper cuts. Taking it literally, yes, I guess it could be possible. However, there's no recorded case of anyone ever actually dying from a thousand paper cuts. No one has that kind of time. We've all gotten a paper cut at some point of our lives and haven't really given them much thought. It happens occasionally, you know, you'll be reading your favorite book, curled up in your chair enjoying life when, as you turn the page, that treacherous little corner nips you. It might sting, but they're more likely to just ruin your mood than kill you. They are tiny, irritating, uh, nothing a little band-aid won't fix. There's no way that one tiny itsy bitsy paper cut is going to do you in, right? Well, actually, in some cases, a tiny little paper cut is all it takes. My hypochondric viewers, if there's any, please stop watching now. In fact, you should have stopped long ago. Books are not going to kill you. You're fine. Trust me. Okay, now in all of these cases, it's not the paper cut itself that ends up killing someone. There's no way you're going to bleed to death or damage some vital organs from a paper cut but rather the ensuing infection that enters our bodies through this seemingly insignificant injury is what ends up being deadly. Death by infection via paper cut is actually surprisingly likely, I found. Well, not likely as in it's happening everywhere at every second. I simply mean that the mere fact that it can definitely happen really shocked me. Necrotizing fasciitis, or better known as the flesh-eating disease, had a small but notable spread in cases in Australia between 2017 and 2018, with one such case involving the disease being introduced into the human body via paper cut. A paper cut which 26-year-old Ryan Taylor received at his office job and which he paid absolutely no mind. Within 12 hours, the disease had spread from his finger all the way down to his elbow, leaving horribly painful swelling and dead flesh along the way. Doctors had to essentially vacuum out the skin while slicing Taylor's arm open in a series of surgeries that lasted a month. This is of course a more sensational case of near death by paper cut, which indeed did not result in death thanks to medical intervention, though it could have. Um, actually, the more common form of infection via paper cut which could kill us is the development of sepsis. Sepsis happens when our body attempts to rid itself of a bacterial infection, but instead ends up damaging the body in this fight, which may begin as fever and ultimately end up in organ failure. The effects of this disease can be so severe that sometimes medical practitioners require severe methods to treat it, such as medically induced comas or even partial or total amputation of all four limbs. Yes, this has happened to people because of a single half inch long paper cut. Sepsis is extremely common and has killed as many as 11 million people worldwide per year. The key to successfully fighting sepsis is an early diagnosis, so next time you get a paper cut, you might want to consider cleaning that shit up with a little bit of alcohol, you know, just to be safe. And get your tetanus shot, everyone. Those little cuts are truly, truly no joke, and now I think I will do all of my reading by wearing welding gloves. <laughs> Mm. 
Now, you've thrown away your life-endangering hardbacks. You're only reading paperbacks, and you're wearing a face covering to ensure that no stray pages find their way down your mouth and lodging in your throat. You are turning every page with a pair of tongs to ensure that there is absolutely no paper cuts. Are you fully safe? Can you truly read your book in peace now without endangering your life? I'm sorry, sweetheart, but you are still going to die. Well, it depends. Nearly every book today, I'm sure, is printed with the utmost safety measures to ensure these objects are safe for human handling. However, if you own certain books from decades past, there's a tiny but possible chance that you own a little toxic death machine. Now let's take a trip back to 1800s in England, the Victorian era when child labor was essential because kids could fit in tight spaces and when cocaine was a valid treatment for mental illness. Needless to say, safety regulations were probably not at their prime during this time. As the private sphere, the home space, evolved during this time into an envisioned shrine to commodities and comforts, a decorative style and charm was essential to every home. Among the various decorations that were newly available for purchase, the wallpaper was particularly en vogue, with endless possibilities as to the mixing of beautiful colors to line your home. The only problem was that one of the main ingredients essential to creating these colors at the time was arsenic, a highly toxic substance. Not as deadly as straight up ingesting it, nonetheless the arsenic found in these wallpapers could lead to slow subtle deaths for homeowners. No one was more aware of this fact than the true visionary Dr. Robert Kedzie. He knew there had been recorded cases of people whose failing health would be attributed to prolonged exposure to arsenic, and he knew he had to get the word out to people in an efficient and considerate way. So what was his solution? His campaign to raise awareness? He published a book that could literally fucking kill you, titled Shadows from the Walls of Death, which admittedly is a metal as hell title. The book not only contained Dr. Kedzie's research and warning notes on the subject of arsenic in wallpapers, he also made sure to include full spreads of wallpaper samples laced with actual arsenics, just to really drive the point home. Now how exactly was this supposed to help? I really don't know. Maybe to warn people that the pretty colors were actually dangerous or to help them identify them in their home? Uh, maybe to actually hope someone died from touching the pages of his book just so he could say, told you so, dumbass. I'm sure there could have been better ways to spread awareness than including the very thing you're warning people about in your book. I mean, you don't see books warning about anthrax, including a little sample on page 35. But there you have it. Dr. Ketsy's book will certainly kill you if you lick your fingers while turning the page or if you stick your nose in it closely. He sent this book to about 100 libraries in Michigan, many of which destroyed it because obviously that's what you do when someone sends you a book full of arsenic. Some copies still survive plastered with warnings as to how to safely read them, and many libraries have encased the wallpaper samples in plastic to avoid exposure, and other stills have simply digitized it to avoid contact entirely. But if you, say, snuck into one of these libraries, uh, took the protective cover off while no one was looking, and then you rubbed your hands all over the pretty wallpaper samples, and then you went about your day, then yes, Dr. Ketsy's book could kill you in a very real way. There are actually many other examples of published books containing deadly substances that could most certainly lead to death. In an article by Anne-Marie Cahill, published on the website Book Riot on November 2017, and which I will link in the description because it was truly a fascinating read, she notes that deadly, toxic books come in all forms. Among the examples Cahill notes, she brings up Mary Curie's research notes. Curie is perhaps the most famous physicist to conduct research on radioactivity, and she brought her work with her everywhere, in many ways. Noted to have constantly carried around radioactive materials with her, not just for research, but because she thought they looked pretty when they glowed, uh, the radioactivity carried over to all of her utensils, including her written notes. Curie's research notes are radioactive and will remain so for 1,500 years, 
so you still have a chance to be murdered by them. If you were to read them or get dangerously close to them, then yes, they will kill you. Another example provided by Cahill is Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. I have my own copy right here, but fret not, this copy is completely safe. No, if you really wanted to be murdered by Bradbury's masterpiece, you're going to have to do some digging. So as you may well know, the novel features the concept of book burning heavily, and if you have never read it, I really think you should. When it was first published in 1953 as part of a promotional sort of tongue-in-cheek gimmick, the publishing company thought it would be fun to make a limited edition run bound in heat-resistant materials. Back then, no one was really aware of the dangers behind breathing in asbestos, so that's the substance they decided to go with. So if you were to own one of these limited edition coveted copies and display it proudly in your home, there's a chance it would end up killing you, as best as being a highly dangerous substance that can cause inflammation and scarring of the lungs, known as asbestosis, along with being a possible cause of lung cancer. I personally don't think that's worth it, so I'm gonna be sticking with my copy. Well, there you have it. Actual toxic books. Who would have thought it possible? Uh, there truly is nothing sacred, I guess. Uh, I'm not really sure how else to end this section except, um, I don't know, check your books for a black mold and good luck. So I think that's as far as we're gonna go in regard to a physical book killing you. Though I do think the possibilities are endless as with any other object big enough to cause injury. I spent, well, a lot longer than I thought I would on the subject, and if you found the conversation of books physically killing you interesting and entertaining, then I'm happy and thank you. But I know some of you may be a bit disappointed, as you were probably expecting death by book in a less literal sense. Well, the time has come to finally speak on the matter. Earlier, I gave you a long-winded dissection of the definition of a book, telling you we may use the word book to refer to an object, but also to literature in general. Now, the question stands, can literature kill you? Can the act of reading kill you? Can the sheer power, emotion, or ideology of a story be enough to prove fatal? Let's go ahead and see if indeed such a thing is possible. <laughs> Inhale. Take in as much air as you can. This story should last about as long as you can hold your breath, and then just a little bit longer. So listen as fast as you can. These are the opening lines of Chuck Palahniuk's short story, Guts, first published in the March 2004 issue of Playboy magazine, before being collected in his well-known book, Haunted, in 2005. With this introduction, Palahniuk invites us to listen as we hold our breath while he unravels three separate snippets describing sexual acts ending in mutilation and human tragedy. The third one he goes into by far the most gruesome and detailed is the most infamous part of the story, the segment that makes Guts so memorable and powerful. I'm not going to spoil what the story is about, I'm only giving you a fair content warning. It is unflinching, vivid, and extremely repulsive. I think you should read it for yourself. I, I actually think it's a good story and I recommend it. Now you may well be asking, what does this have to do with what this video is about? Where does Guts fit into the whole narrative of killer books? Well, I think it introduces the concept of fatal literature better than any other story could given its infamy and the spell that it has seemingly cast on dozens and dozens of people who have listened to it. You see, more so than just being infamous for the explicitness of its gruesome and disturbing content, Guts has also become perhaps the most notorious short story in recent memory because of a series of incidents that have unfolded ever since Palahniuk began to do live readings of the story. You see, Guts is perhaps the most infamous short story of the 21st century because, reportedly, 73 people in total have fainted while listening to Palahniuk read his story. Guts is reportedly so disturbing, so visceral, so powerful that it can send you to the ground unconscious. 
it has negative consequences on the health of its listeners. The words within these pages are configured in such a way that they invoke power, disease, a psychic attack that strikes mercilessly at human sensibilities. Such reports make it apparent that books, as in literature, stories, written words, do possess to some extent the ability to damage us physically, making it perhaps the closest thing we've experienced in recent years to a story being able to kill someone. Of course, I have read Guts. As soon as I heard that there were reports of dozens of people fainting just by listening to it, I had to find out what it was about. Now, I did not faint. If you are also a fan of disturbing or transgressive fiction, which we have established you probably are if you're watching this, then I'm sorry to say that you probably won't faint if you read it either. I think we have all been so desensitized, so used to this kind of writing that the most it might do is make some of you say, ew, under your breath while you keep reading it. Of course, the power that Guts has seems to vary from person to person, and those that have fainted were probably just less desensitized or more sensible to words or perhaps had a mixture of pre-existing health conditions that made them especially vulnerable. But hey, give it a shot, you might be one of the lucky ones. To a certain extent, I am even dubious as to whether the stories of people fainting are entirely true or maybe just exaggerated. The incidents have been described in various ways and I think Palahniuk likes to keep facts ambiguous, but here's what I've been able to gather. From the article by Dan Gleister published in The Guardian on March 12, 2004, I was able to gather some information. Gleister attended a reading of Guts and spoke to Palahniuk in Las Vegas while he was promoting the then newly published Haunted. After reading Guts, Palahniuk asked his audience if anyone had fainted. No one raised their hand, but some people pointed to an empty seat, saying its former occupant had been carried out of the theater after passing out, although some others disputed that it had been because of an epileptic fit, not the power of the story. Polyneuk goes on to tell Gleister that the tally of people who had fainted up to that point was 40. It thus appears that Polyneuk has been the only one keeping count. On other occasions, from personal accounts I read across some blogs, people reportedly have fainted, four or five people at a time being carried out of live readings with ambulances waiting outside, though of course I was not able to verify any of these incidents 100%. It seems that the existence of this faint tally is directly from Palahniuk's mouth and no one else's. And of course, he could be lying, but I will say I don't think he is. However, I do think the reports are greatly exaggerated or sensationalized. If we consider the circumstances of the live readings of Guts, the opening lines which I read to you earlier are probably key in understanding what's going on. The story asks its readers slash listeners to hold their breath while the story is told. I imagine that out of all the people that have fainted listening to the story, a good chunk of them must have fainted because they were actually holding their breath for too long and eventually passed out from lack of oxygen, not because of fear or disgust. Polyneuk has gleefully written the spectacle of shock and transgressive fiction since the beginning of his career, so I can only imagine the fact that some people initially fainting while listening to his story brought him endless joy and a highly effective marketing ploy. I personally don't blame him. I mean, if people fainted from listening to a story I wrote, I would milk that fact for all it's worth, too. Now, like I said, I don't doubt that some people probably fainted because of the contents of the story, but those instances must be rare and could have well been triggered by various other things. As I said from the Guardian article I read, reportedly only one person fainted and even that was disputed. Polyniuk even states that no one actually fainted in various live readings he did in London prior to his Vegas appearance. It's of course only natural that we're compelled to sensationalize the idea that 73 people have fainted while listening to this story and not the idea that thousands of other people who have read it or listened to it felt absolutely nothing. And even if indeed these 73 people fainted from the disturbing nature of this story, it still isn't a strong enough case to declare that the act of reading is enough to kill. 
Besides the fact that no one has died from listening to Guts, although what a story that would be, it is actually not rare for people of extremely frail health or with pre-existing heart conditions to pass out or perish with any moderately exhilarating or exciting activity. I guess books are as deadly in this sense as films or TV shows are. The Passion of the Christ or Avatar are deadlier than Guts as they have actually killed people, but that doesn't necessarily make them more disturbing than Guts. Perhaps just more stimulating for easily excitable people. So in a sense, I can see someone dying from reading a particularly shocking story or novel, but it would be an extremely, extremely rare case following very particular circumstances. For the average Joe, however, dying from reading might be impossible. Indeed, it seems that tales of literature that kills are so often muddled in ambiguity and disputable statements, as is the case with Polyneuk, or only straight up myth, as is the case for others. If you have ever perused the contents of creepy pastas, as I surely have, you may have indeed come across dozens and dozens of stories that will reportedly kill you if you read them. This is the nature of endless chain letters as well. I remember as a kid when I first started using YouTube, I read a comment under a Smosh video or something that stated something along the lines of do not stop reading. By reading this comment, you have been cursed. Copy and paste this comment on 10 different videos or the vengeful spirit of so-and-so will come at 3 a.m. and tear your face off. Now, of course, being 12 years old and new to the internet, I shit my pants and did as I was told. Back then, I guess I really believed that the act of reading could kill in this supernatural sense, but as with everything else, innocence and wonder die the older you grow. Perhaps some of us have heard of Tomino's Hell, uh, the most famous example of literature of this kind. Uh, supposedly, Tomino's Hell is a Japanese poem published in 1919 that warns of dire consequences if it is read out loud. Supposedly, people will die if they dare to utter its content. Of course, it's only an urban legend, but I do find some comfort in knowing that other people, other cultures, are equally fascinated with finding or believing in a story so powerful and evil that it will kill you. Japanese mythology seems particularly obsessed with this concept. There exists another Japanese urban legend about a fictional story called Gozu, which means cowhead, Supposedly, the cowhead story is so horrifying that people who read it or hear it are overcome with fear so great that they tremble violently for days on end until they die. This is exactly the kind of tale I search for endlessly for this video, and of course, it doesn't exist. While well, fun and exciting to think about, and certainly an intriguing writing prompt or something, and horrifying to those naive enough to believe it, Literature holds no such power over the minds or the bodies of people. Literature is definitely strong enough to uplift us, to empower us, to imbue our soul with ideals and meaning, but it just isn't powerful enough to kill someone. Or is it? What if I told you that within history there has indeed existed a book whose contents strangled, warped, and tortured the mind so extensively that its stronghold ended tragically in multiple deaths. Now you might be thinking, what sick, twisted, disgusting piece of literary work could be so offensive, fearful, and noxious as to actually kill? What could be even more revolting than Guts or any of the other books I've talked about on this channel? Well, that's the curious thing about it. The book that has managed the feat of bringing death to its readers is nothing of the sort. This deadly book is actually a short romantic epistolary novel first published in 1774, The Sorrows of Young Werther by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Now this book will certainly not kill anybody these days, but when it was first published, predating the actual storm of romanticism that overtook Europe in the following decades, the sheer exploration of the ideas found within the novel dealing with societal discontent unrequited love and suicide absolutely astonished its contemporary readership, many denouncing and praising the supposedly real letters left behind by the young titular character 
before committing suicide over a lover he could not have. More so than just a little depressing book about a young man with a broken heart, the spellbinding nature of the story was such that it absolutely captivated the minds and lives of hundreds of German youths, many of them identifying with Werther at a personal level. The cultural impact of Werther was undeniable, not just in the philosophy it brought about that later solidified as the Romantic movement, but particularly because of the Werther fever it caused among German youth. Reportedly, many young men after reading the book began emulating the fictional Werther's clothing style and speech mannerisms, and people even started slinging Werther merch, such as prints and perfumes. It was obvious how deeply people identified with Werther, wanting to be like him, embracing his ideology fully. Of course, with such a cultural fever coming from a tragic story, things in real life soon turned tragic as well. Past this Werther fever, Goethe's novel soon brought about a string of copycat suicides among young men in the years following its publication. Reportedly, not only was the book often found at the scene of multiple suicides across Germany, but the victims were often found dressed similarly to Werther and had even used similar pistols as the one described in the novel. The mass hysteria was such that authorities even undertook measures in response to the craze, some cities even banning the book and the Werther clothing style. Now, many modern historians dismiss this string of copycat suicides as pure myth and gossip, but I personally believe it fully, because sadly, we have seen too many examples of this in contemporary life. The obsession with fictional stories, with fictional characters, or even our own idolization of celebrities have tragically led many to take their own lives or take other people's lives. Fiction and idealization causing many to lose their footing in reality, with mental illness of course playing a strong role in many such cases, and which was probably not diagnosable at the time The Sorrows of Young Werther was published. The hysteria nonetheless is fascinating, and I can say with full confidence that the sad reality portrayed by the words of Goethe's novel were possibly strong enough to have killed. Thoughts, ideas, infuse our minds when we read, drown them in particular moods, particular frames of thinking, and the effects of this infusion can certainly be devastating. Ideological intoxication is something that can definitely happen when we read. The sadness sometimes becomes unbearable, a poison to our already fragile moods. This fatal infusion of ideas, as we saw happen in Goethe's novel, is the perfect segue into the last section of this video. What I honestly believe is the most real way in which literature can kill. We have concluded that perhaps there is no story so shocking or terrifying that it will kill you on the spot as you read it, but what do we make of the ideas behind the story? What can happen when we put the book down and actually begin to think about what we just read? Goethe's prose led to death, but not in a physiological sense, not in the way Polyneuk mythologizes. The effects of literature are much more psychological than physical, but this psychological effect, as we will see, is more than enough to turn a book deadly. Books have actually been tied to murder scenes on various occasions, but rarely as the murder weapon. Even on the occasions that it has been the murder weapon, however, as we discussed with the Bible killings previously, I would argue that the book was tied to the barbaric acts in a less literal and incidental way, even if they became the object that physically killed someone. As with Satnay and Brune, they chose the Bible not just because it was the most effective weapon at hand, but more so because of what it represented. The ideology, the symbolism carried by the book is what ultimately led these cases to end in death. Books carry ideologies, social and political philosophies, theories, systems of ideas that suffuse us and help us to think, to draw conclusions, to build our own morality, to strengthen our opinions on any given topic. Books are fearful not just because of how heavy or, you know, filled with asbestos they might be, or because they tell nasty or shocking or depressing stories. 
Books are fearful because they all carry ideas, and there is no telling what effect these ideas will have on any given person. The examples are endless. The Bible itself has inspired countless crusades, brutal colonialism, genocides, and war atrocities, all too numerous to list, because its ideas are powerful, and the ideology and beliefs which it represents are so varied, so passionate, and so conflicting. What we make of literature is ultimately our own choice, our own supposition, our own responsibility. Nevertheless, when such ideas stem from books, I don't think it's too outrageous or out of line to refer to books as the harbingers of death on many particular occasions. The grander schematics of ideology and death would necessitate a study of phenomenology which we could keep going with for hours and hours. <laughs> There have just been too many examples of literature harboring deadly ideologies that have resulted in very real deaths. Malleus Maleficarum, the most infamous manual for effectively identifying and hunting witches during colonial times. The many manifestos and autobiographies composed by dictators and tyrants charting out their genocidal plans. And even writings that have skewed facts challenge science and research in a bold display of neglectful, ignorant, and ultimately murderous schemes. Let's not forget that the principal difficulties that have led to this current pandemic being as deadly as it has been came from written tweets and phony news articles. Yes, the written form has detailed, outlined, influenced death in more ways than we can count. It is scary. It is powerful. Beyond this more depressing existential dread regarding the power of writing and how it has influenced our endless death drive, there have been more concrete and peculiar instances in which books have warped human minds to the point of turning murderous what would originally just be regarded as innocent. While books have often directly influenced policy and ideology in ways that have resulted in deaths, there have been many instances in which reading seemingly unrelated books has nonetheless led down the same path. We've all heard of those people who sought to carry out a murder with a book at hand. We know that Mark David Chapman had on him a copy of The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger when he shot John Lennon, which he read and obsessed over. And the Unabomber's life and tactics highly resemble details written in The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad, which he read multiple times. Stephen King, one of my favorite authors, allowed one of his novels, Rage, to go out of publication after a series of school-related murders and deaths tied back to the perpetrators having the book in their possession, the book involving similar acts of violence in a school setting. To this day, the novel remains out of publication, which King himself has called a good thing. Other books that have been tied to murder scenes include A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess and The Queen of the Damned by Anne Rice. Some of these books deal with violent subject matter directly, sure, and all of them deal with negative emotions in some way. Um, perhaps we could go on a conservative tirade and blame the books along with the video games and movies and that dreaded rock and roll music. However, unlike the writings of Lenin or Hitler, these books do not call for violence. They do not incite or recommend it. It is the human mind that draws out real-life violence from it, using them to justify atrocious acts they would have committed regardless. It is not that the printed word is deadly, but the way it's filtered, distilled through our eyes. If it had not been Catcher in the Rye for Mark David Chapman, it could have been Peter Rabbit. Even literature that is not necessarily violent has nonetheless been appropriated by groups of people to commit heinous acts of violence. Om Shinrikyo, a murderous Japanese doomsday cult which eventually performed a series of terrorist attacks on the Tokyo subways in 1995, had Isaac Asimov's Foundation sci-fi series as their sacred texts, their instructions for action. Fantastic outlandish science fiction led people to commit very real acts of violence. In this sense, I don't think it's fully accurate to say that the books killed people. Like I mentioned before, books in these cases were simply hijacked, used to justify, not enable. 
However, the warning to heed from these examples is that the human mind is surely a fragile, impressionable thing, and the importance of mental health is crucial with preventing tragedies and atrocities of this kind. But beyond unrelated acts of murderous violence inspired by books, most often death can come not from the act of reading, but from writing. It really does seem that the most vulnerable people who fall victim to the ideology of books are the same people that wrote those books. Most of us are familiar with Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses, uh, the contents of which led Rushdie to fall under a fatwa issued by the Ayatollah of Iran demanding that the author be killed, along with everyone involved in its publication. Following a series of murder attempts, we know that Rushdie is safe to this day, but what many don't know is the story of Hitoshi Igarashi, who was stabbed to death in 1991 by an unknown assailant. Most theories as to the perpetrator point to the fact that his murder may have been related to the fact that Igarashi translated Rushdie's novel to Japanese. The ideology which Rushdie's novel stirred and inspired certainly led to a very real death in this case. Moreover, countless writers during Stalin's regime were declared non-persons and disposed of when they dared to write beyond the strict guidelines provided by his dictatorship. Today, journalism is one of the most dangerous professions to undertake in Mexico. If those in power, either political or clandestine power through organized crime, dislike what you are writing about, chances are your life will be endangered and countless journalists have been found mysteriously dead all across the nation, deaths left unsolved, although everybody knows. Reading can come to fatal consequences, but so can writing. If the books are not deadly per se, if it's someone inaccurate to declare them responsible for death, then we can at least say that what we take off the pages and bring with us, what accumulates in our mind, what shapes our thinking and rationale, can certainly be fatal. Books, in the literal sense, can hurt us. They can kill us with enough brute strength or if they are covered in toxic substances. But these cases are, as I have said before, rare, curious oddities, freak accidents, or highly unusual deaths. Death by books, in the figurative sense, death by the word, by literature itself, however, is very real. It is the reason why we should regard literature with high reverence and respect. We can always assure that books remain in our bookshelves, that they don't cause us physical harm, and they rarely do. But the ideas within them, they are not so easy to contain, and there is no telling what they will inspire. If you stuck all the way through to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you learned something. Uh, as always, I truly appreciate every single one of you. And please let me know of any feedback you may have, any comments or thoughts on the subject, anything in the comments below. Um, be sure to follow me on my Instagram, which I will leave in the description um, if you want. You don't have to. <laughs> uh, and please stay safe and keep reading. But do so responsibly and please be careful. Um, don't let it get to your head too much. <laughs> uh, I will be seeing you some other time along in the week. Um, and yeah, as always, thank you for watching and I hope you have a beautiful day.